This morning I want to finish this message and I'm going to be sharing, this is the second part of yes, last week's message and, and as I uh, was preaching last week, God, I already knew the direction of where God had my heart to go and so when I finished last week I was saying, man, I just want to finish the last part of this, but I believe God has a purpose and a plan for what he's doing and uh, I think that as, as we open our hearts and we open our minds to the message that God is speaking to us today, we're going to continue to talk about the harvest because I believe it's important for us to know that's what God has for us. What you're going through and what I'm going through and the circumstances that we're facing and the things that are going on in this world today are for a purpose to reach the harvest. Amen. The storms, the, 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 all the commotion and all the things that are going on around the world, the, the wars and rumors of wars, the things that are happening, the, the storms, the, the earthquakes, all of this is happening so that we can prepare hearts and minds and get them ready to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the sad thing is we get oftentimes so caught up in our own problems that we fail to see the opportunity that God has before us. Amen? Amen. You may not be able to give a dime to a project, but you can give a message of, 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 of love and concern. Amen? And when you do that, you begin to share the message of Jesus Christ and his help. We've reached out as a church and we've given to different projects, but one of the strongest things that they need is people on the ground to share the love of Jesus Christ in these situations. That's really what's important. And I believe that God can restore, and I believe he does restore us in this way. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the, the book of Matthew once again. My text will be coming from the book of Matthew, starting in verse 35 through 38 again. Last week I preached about the first two sections of this scripture, and I preached predominantly about the condition of the world that we're in today and some of the circumstances that we're facing. For those of you who are, are uh, visiting today, we want to make sure that you get an opportunity, fill out a visitor's card, let us know you were here, and we have some gifts for you back there in the back, and we hope that you'll take time to get those, and they're just for you. We have those, and, uh, and, and that's what we ask. If you didn't get a visitor's card, stop by back there by the box in the back, Grab one of those visitor's cards, fill it out, and Pete will be more than glad to give you a, a gift, uh, and, and he is just so thrilled to do that. Amen? We want you, if you have your Bibles, you've turned with me. Let's go to Matthew, the ninth chapter. And read with me. If you don't have your scriptures up here, we have it on the screen, uh, and, and we, want, we want you to stay with us. Go, with the, go one, one scripture back. There we go. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 35 and 36. Je, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and, and every sickness among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were uh, weary and scattered, and like sheep having no shepherd. And I, I preached last week about those two scriptures predominantly, and, and preparing us for the understanding of that's what the harvest is all about is seeing the need around us and, and being compassionate about what we see. Understanding, being moved and motivated. It's not about us. Amen? The harvest is not just about us. It's preparing for the future. It's preparing for what God is doing. It's preparing. And, and I believe that when we get to the place to where we are motivated beyond ourselves, we will see opportunities that surround us every day. To share the love of Jesus Christ and sharing it in such a way. Verse 37 says this, And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now those scriptures that I just read, those last two, there are four main characters that I want to predominantly talk about in this, and I'm going to be sharing with you about these four topics, and, and I want you to look at these four things. Go ahead, and these characters of the harvest. The first one is, is the Lord of the harvest, and we'll talk just a little bit about that. Secondly, we'll see the harvest itself, the lost and those in need. Then thirdly, we see the laborers, and, and I want you to, to realize that that laborer is, is you and I. So I just want you to look at somebody right in the eye, and I want you to tell them you're a laborer for the kingdom of God. Amen. You are a laborer. Amen? Uh, we're not talking about white-collar workers here. We're talking about laborers. Amen. Laying your hand to the plow and getting busy with it. Amen. We're talking about going to work for the kingdom of God. Whatever he has for us to do. And then, then finally, 
those who were asked to pray. We're going to talk about that this morning, and that I've, I'll do my best to stay with the outline, but I, I've got so much in my heart that I want to share. The first thing I want you to look at is whose harvest is it? I want you to think about this. The harvest that we're talking about today is not yours and mine. It's not about the church of God. It's not about a denomination. It's not about uh, Life Church at South Mountain becoming bigger and having more people. It's about seeing the very works of what God has called us to do. You see, the harvest is God's harvest. You see, he, 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 he would that none would perish, but all would have eternal life. It is not God's will that any one of us would die and go to hell. It is not the will of God for the, the prostitute down on the street. Uh, it, it's not God's will for the drug addict. It's not God's will that any should perish. Amen. Amen. That's the harvest. That's the one that needs the gospel message. And we sit here and we sit in our comfortable seats and, and we freeze to death in the air conditioning. You know, I can tell those, those that, are, that have been here for a while and, and those that are hot-blooded like to sit in the middle because that's where the air hits you. But those who have been here for a while, they gravitate to the wall. They, they get out of the air a little bit. That's what, we're gonna, we need to get ceiling fans in here so we can circulate that cold air and let everybody enjoy it. This is God's harvest, and God wants us to reach this harvest, and the ripeness of the harvest, and the need of the harvest, the urgency of the harvest. It, it, listen, uh, we, don't, we don't have time to vote and decide how we're going to do this. We don't have time to put together programs and events. What we need to do is get busy sharing the gospel message with our family and our loved ones. If we would just start reaching our friends and our family that are in the proximity of our own home, we would fill this place twice over. Amen. This wouldn't hold all the people. Thank you, brother and sister Padilla. Preach, help me preach my message. I love it when we do that, when we get together. With, if, if, listen, the closest one that, that we have to us to reach is our family. And yet we get so busy and preoccupied that we forget that's who God sent us to minister to. When we look at the harvest, we realize that it's God's harvest. And we realize that it is His harvest and that none should perish. We realize in Romans, the fifth chapter and verse 8. I want you to look at this and, and read what it says here. It says, but God demonstrated His love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The nature of His love for us was He didn't wait for us to be perfect to be the harvest. He waited for us and He said, while you are still sinners, He died for you. I'm going to tell you this, if it not for the grace of God, we would be no different than any other sinner in the street. But somehow somebody got you the message that there's a God who loves you and cares for you and he sent his son to die for you. They're no different than we are and they need to be reached. We need to take that message to them. The urgency of the hour is the lateness of the hour. We don't have a lot of time. The time is, is urgent. That's why if we can invest in anything, it's investing in the harvest. Trying to reach it and to, to, to get out there and do it. Somebody said, Pastor, how in the world? Listen, I have a great um, uh, group of men that are on my pastor's council. And a lot of times they'll say, how can we afford it? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's time we start saying, how can we afford not to do something? Amen? Right. Amen? It's the urgency of doing the best that we can do to reach them. Amen. And it's the urgency of the hour to take advantage of opportunities. Technology is one of the ways that I, look, I am about as technically challenged as anyone in this room. I have to ask my teenage son how to work my cell phone most of the time. I, I, I depend on James and Tyler when they come in the office and I, I'll ask them, I said, how do you do this? And they'll get me on there and, and they'll, they'll show me how to do things. And, and the other day, I, we were sitting in the office and Tyler sat down at my computer and he was trying to show me how to get to something and he looked at my computer and he goes, how long has it been since you updated this thing? <laughs> I don't know. When did you clean it up? When did you do the virus check? When you, and he went through, and, and in about 10 minutes, he did what it had taken me almost nine years to do. 
And, 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 and all of that being said is that, listen, we are into a technical age that is far beyond my idea and my realm. I would have never thought the necessity of having church was to put a projector up there. Amen. But people love it. It, was, it would have not been my necessity. Listen, I am the last one that would want to be on camera. Thank goodness Ben has figured out how to make me skinny on TV. He says it's because of the lights, but I really think he's trying to help my ego, you know. And if you ever watch us online, he, he slims it up there so I'm skinny. I'm tall. I'm about six foot two on, on the... No. No, oh, I'm just kidding all that. But technology, I never would have thought that would have been necessary. But you know what? Right now, it's one of the greatest tools of reaching people around the community. A website on the... We get more contacts and more calls, people outside of this church, by our website than anything else in our church. Amen. It used to be the only way they would know us is because of the blue cross on top of our church. That's just part of it now. People are saying, oh yeah, I saw your website. They said, you look much fatter in person. But anyways, I don't, don't go there. But th th God demonstrated his love. God told us the technology, the challenges that we have. We must overcome those things. In 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 9, he says this, In this is the, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. One of the greatest things that you can do right now is this. You don't have to condemn people. You don't have to tell them that they're living bad or you don't have to look at them and say, you, you are awful. You just, just turn, turn the, listen, if you really want to make somebody they just turn to them and say, you're awful, you're rotten, you stink, you're, you're dirty, you grow up, you, 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 well, don't that make you feel good? No. no, thank you, Renee, for that emphasis of, no, no that doesn't. You know what you need to do? Is you need to look at someone and say, God loves you. God loves you in spite of what you are and all that you've done. God loves you and God cares for you. God sent his son to die. If it was just for you, he would have sent his son to die for you. God loves you. The world tells them all the other things that they, they, they hear. That The world tells them how bad they are. The world tells them of all the problems and the issues that they have. The world tells them of how, how the things in their world are falling apart. What they need to hear is a church that says, God loves you and we love you. Yep. Amen. 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 God will work out the details. But we need to let them know that God loves them. And that we love them. Next, we realize that, that not only does God, is he the Lord of the harvest, and, and this is God's harvest. God started and planted the seed through Jesus Christ and began the, the planting of that seed is what grows the harvest. You see, you can't have a harvest without the seed. And the seed had to be planted. On a cross 2,000 years ago, God sent forth his son so that the seed of the harvest could be planted. And it has become ripe in the fields and it is ready to be reached. I was almost offended the other day. I was watching the news and they said that in the United States we have changed, that such a dr dramatic change has taken place in our society that we are no longer considered a Christian nation or are leading the way in, in the Christian relationships. We have slowly deteriorated to become nothing more than a secular pothole for, for all kinds of different, different religions. Let me tell you something. I believe the message of Jesus Christ needs to be proclaimed louder and louder by every believer. We don't need to take a back seat. I praise the Lord for those who step up front and say, I'm a believer and I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ nor the power of his cross. It saved me and it forgave me. And whatever platform you can speak it from, tell the world Jesus Christ saves. Amen. The church is, we've, we've gone to sleep. We have taken a back seat and we want to be quiet. We want to just get along. But that's not what God sent us to. We are to come to make a loud noise. It was the noise that drew the attention on the day of Pentecost. And that's what Pentecost is all about, is making noise about the Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Secondly, we realize that he was not only talking about the harvest and whose harvest it was, but he talked about the need of the harvest. You see, the harvest is truly ripe. The need of the people is, is there. Look at what it says here. Go ahead and pull up that next slide there. If you look at this, the laborers, we are God's fellow workers. Amen? That's what it says. Now, I like what the King James says because it ties in better with my message. It says, for we are laborers together with God. We are his handyman. We, listen, the reason that we are still here, the church is still here, and I can tell you this right now. I believe we've been teaching on this on Wednesday nights, and we've been talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we've been sharing a little bit about that. I believe that the only reason that the church is still here is because God wants us to reach the rest of the harvest. Amen. There is so much of the harvest, and there's so much of a, of a magnitude in the moment. We, we, have, we have spent hours and, and we have spent years and, and some of you that are historians in the church you know this we have spent years training and, 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 and sending out missionaries all over the gospel and we have failed to reach the the main mission field and that is the harvest field that's right around us Amen. I believe in world missions and I believe the gospel's got to be spread around the world and I believe that there is a work to be done around the globe but I believe there's a, a work to be done right here in, in, in Phoenix Arizona in the communities that we live in and surrounding. My, my dad and mom have been looking for houses. They, they always do this. They come out here every year and they go looking at houses and they get these real estate agents all fired up. My dad's pre-approved and they go and they say, oh yeah, we, we're, we're looking to move out here. I, I've been out here 30 years and you ain't moved here yet. <laughs> mom says, one of these days... I'll be retired and gone by then, Mom. Right. I'm going to tell you something. Here's what it is. My dad was saying the other day, he said, it's so unique. You go from one city to the next city to the next city, and it's almost like you don't even know you, you left one. Unless you read the street signs, you don't even know it. My, we were driving from, uh, from where I live. We go, we go through Mesa and then Chandler and go through Tempe and, and then into Phoenix, and you come all the way across there. And I said, what a harvest field. It's not just the, the I mean, I, looked, I used to look out and say, that's my harvest field. And I would see the city. If you go up on top of this building, I'm going to put a ladder out there if you really want to see it. You go up on top of this building and you look out across that city. And there's a beautiful layout of the city from this right here. And you can see the outlay of the city. And I used to say, that's the harvest field. And then I began to think about it. I moved out to the east, and now the harvest field is out that way. And then I, I, we've got folks that live out this way. and we got, I'm going to tell you something. God is just broadening it out. Amen? And I'm not to say that there's not other works that are going on and there's not other churches, but I'm going to tell you something. There are people that you know right now that are not going anywhere that need the message of Jesus Christ, and they need to be changed. They need to be reached. Amen. They may never come into a church service. That they might show up for a fall festival. Yep. Especially a free one, huh? You know what I mean. <laughs> free is good. They might show up for a, a potluck dinner. Or, or, I'll tell you what would really work. You know, if you really want to be tricky on them, here's what you do. Listen, if you come to church and you bring your family to church, I tell you what. My family, your family, we'll all go out and I'll buy you lunch. Jamie's already taking me up. I mean, it's not hard to get people to church. Sometimes you have to be a little creative. Sometimes you have to be motivated. Come on. Amen. I didn't say you had to take them to some expensive restaurant. Take them to Taco Bell. I don't care. Used to be when we did church, when, when you'd invite somebody to church, what you did was you invited them home. And you'd fix lunch and you'd say, y'all come over to my house and we're going to have potluck. We're going to have pot roast. We're going to have, you, we're going to come over and we're going to, and you can have, a, a, we're going to fix a meal. Nobody cooks at home much anymore. So it's just as easy to say, let's go out and eat. Because I know y'all eat. Amen. I can see that. Come on. 
Amen. We are laborers together with God. That laboring puts the hands to the plow. It means that we have to work. The word labor is not something to be ignored there. It is the work that God has placed us. We must work until it, He comes. We are to work while it is day because night will come when no one can work. There is a period of time that we have now that God has given us as a church to reach the lost. And we must do our part to we reach them. Amen. We must be motivated. Fellow workers, we wait on God to do everything. And sometimes we sit back. But if, if you look at the scripture, God didn't tell us that he was going to do it all for us. He told us to go, to do, to reach. And, and our job is to go, to do, to reach. Not to sit back and say, God, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. The Bible says, go and compel them to come in. Amen. Martin, what would you say compel means? Strongly persuade. I knew that was right on the tip of your tongue right there. To strongly, if I want him to go somewhere, I, come on, Martin, come with me. Come on. No, let's go this way. Let's go this way. No, let's go this way. Let's go this way. No, no, no let's go this way. Come on, let's go. I got, no. See, I'm persuading him by pulling on his arm. And some of you that can't see, I'll bring you up front so we can parade up here. So you got to drag him. I've got to pull. I'm persuading him to go with me. Now, he could say, Pastor, I ain't going with you. I've had enough of this. And he's about to say that. <laughs> but, but, but because we have a relationship, he says, okay, I'll go. I'll go. And that's what God is doing in us as laborers together is to compel them to come in, to reach them, to go to them. We, we, we can't wait for them to show up here at church. We're missing the moment. It's great when somebody just says, I saw the church and there was an aura about it. And the anointing was so strong that I could, listen, you know what it is? Somebody said, there's a church on 40th and Baseline that if you'll go to it, you'll like it. They may have saw us on sign. Thank you, sir. I'll compel you to go back to your seat. Unless you just want to stand up here and help me preach. But... But here's what we, somebody had to say there's a church. Somebody had to say there's a place and say you may have drove by and, and God may have been the center of it to direct you here. But I'm going to tell you something. The reason that you stayed was because somebody said we love you. Yep. Amen. Somebody said we care. Somebody did something. And I'm going to tell you something. When we have the opportunity, we've got to do that. Amen. And it takes Amen. effort. Okay, I'm going to be mean for just a minute. Some of you have to come out of your shell and be nice yep. and be loving yep. and be caring and be sharing because we, we get so caught up in our own life that we, that's all we think about and we don't think about the needs of anybody else that walks in. We had a young man that came to our church Sit in the seat, sit in the seat, got here early for church because he was, found out what time online, looked at our website and found out what time we start. So he showed up and got here early, sat through the entire service, and did you know he said that only a few people, if any, said anything to him? After the service, he said he left. I, I follow up and I called him and I said, tell me what you thought of it. He goes, well, you said it was friendly, but it isn't very friendly. Nobody said much to me. Nope. I don't know. I, I said, give it another try. I said, maybe you just hit us on a bad day. Maybe you're too scary and nobody wanted to be around you. But here, I'm going to tell you something. When God sends somebody in this place, we need to grab hold of them and tell them we love you. I mean, it, it sounds scary. But we need to be scary sometimes. We, we, I mean, it is Halloween season, you know. But I believe you've got to go out of your way to be nice. Because this may be the only time that they get a friendly handshake. This may be the only opportunity that they get to hear that Jesus loves them. This may be the only opportunity that they get to hear that Jesus cares.
This may be the only opportunity that they... And they, you don't have to preach a message to them. All you have to do is shake their hand and say, God loves you and we love you. Yes. Let me go on. Labor is together. I got a couple slides here that I wanted you to... Brother Farr is not here this morning. He had to go home and take care of his wife. But it says, I am just a nobody telling everybody about somebody that can save anybody. And his name is Jesus. If you could just write that down somewhere... So when you get ready to, you can share that because that's a, that's a saying that you need to keep. Because listen, we're all just nobodies telling everybody about somebody that can save anybody and his name is Jesus. The next one I like real well, it's a cliche of a scripture and it sound, it's out of Colossians, the fourth chapter, verse five. I pulled this off the internet. I saw, it says, live wisely among those who are non, not believers. In one translation it says non-believers. And make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. If we can do that, we can begin to reach this community. By reaching this community, I'm not talking about getting them one to our church, but I am believing that we can lead them to the, to the to place to where they will have a relationship with Christ. God will put them where they can be fed so that they can grow in Christ. Amen. Three things about soul winning, and then I'm going to move on to my last point. Three things that I want to tell you about soul winning. First of all, I, want, I don't want to bust anybody's bubbles. But you cannot save anyone. You need, to, you need to hear this. This is not in my notes, Laura, so you're going to have to kind of listen and, and repeat it. We cannot save anyone. That's not what God called us to do. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for a lost and dying world. The only thing that we can do is lead them to Christ. Amen. The second thing about soul winning is this. You must be aggressive, but positive. You must be aggressive, but positive. There is no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. You cannot butter it up and make it sound good. Oh, if you just pay your tithe. If you just come to church, if you just sit on the pew, I'm going to tell you something. It has nothing to do with any of the works that you can do. What it has to do with, by faith, leading them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the only way. You can't bend it around a corner or twist it to make it fit so that somebody feels comfortable with your message. We must proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only way. You must be precise in that. You know, here, here's what you can say. A lot of people will do this, and I, 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 I'm not going to try to pinpoint any, any big-name preachers, but there are a lot of big-name preachers that are out there. And one of the things that they'll do, and one of the they try to do is they try to make their message fluffy. You know what I mean by fluffy? They try to make it fit because they don't want to offend anyone. But I'm going to tell you something. You need to stop trying to make it fluffy and you need to start telling them the truth. That if they don't know Jesus Christ and if they haven't accepted him as their Lord and Savior, they're going to die and go to hell. Yep. Right. And it's not my job to judge them. It's not my job to tell somebody they're right or wrong. God has to do that. Yep. Amen? Amen? I can tell them, I can tell by the fruit that they bear. I can tell them by the lifestyle that they live, whether they're living a godly life or not. But there again, it's not my, it's not my job to do that. That's, that's what this word is for. I can tell you this, when you read the word of God, it will tell you right and wrong. Right. You know what a lot of us do? Now they, they out, out what they do is they just put it on the shelf and they pick it up on Sunday when they come to church because they want to be religious. But then when they come to, come to Monday, they leave it on the shelf. Yep. Tuesday on the shelf. Wednesday, they go to Bible study, but they're busy. Thursday, they miss it. Friday, all of a sudden, Sunday comes. Well, hey, where's my Bible? I got to pick it up. I got to. The Bible says, hide the word in your heart that you would not sin against it. The Bible says, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is a book every day to direct your life. Let me tell you something. One of the, one of the things that you get. How many of you have a, a cell phone? 
Come on, tell me the truth. How many of you have a cell phone? It ought to be a unanimous hands up. I mean, when my grandson is like, nine years old and he told me he said papa i got a cell phone i said you do he goes yeah he said i'll call you sometime (laughs) okay he said can i put you on my friends list (laughs) okay i that's what i said garrett i said oh that's so sweet until he calls me about every hour and says hey papa i want to facetime you But we live in, a, in this, this day and age to when we, we all have these cell phones. And, and on that cell phone, how many of you that raised your hand that have a cell phone, you have a Bible app on your cell phone? Okay, less and less hands are going up. How many of you read your Bible app? Are you doing anything with it? Thank you, Brother Bledsoe. He's holding up his old Bible app. I'm going to tell you something. To me, I love it that you have it on your phone, but if you have it on your phone, you're not doing any more with it than what you probably do with your your Bible. If you don't open it and read it, you need to be in a reading program, you need to read this thing, and you need to digest it daily because that's what's going to set you free. And when you lead someone to Christ, you need to sit down with them and you need to talk to them. And and when Jesus saves them, you need to tell them you need to get in the Word of God. Don't bring them to Genesis. They'll be more confused than ever. Oh, let's read Leviticus together so we can understand our salvation. No, what you need to do is get them in the Gospel of John that talks about a God who loves them and forgives them, who sent his son to die for them. You need to go through the Bible and you need to tell them, get them in the Word of God. Oh, there's a time for Leviticus. You need that. There's a time for Genesis. There's a time for all those, those scriptures, and I love that. But you need to be in the Word of God. Amen. And, and, but the best thing, I love it, because here's what you do. You can carry your phone, and nobody will know you have a Bible at all. But when you take one of these, and you lay it down on the corner of your desk, they know what you're about. And there's nothing more precious to me than when I hear this. Just the turning of the pages and searching out. It's beautiful to hear people looking through the Word of God to read, to highlight, to underline. To, to, to. Eric showed me a Bible, and Eric, I'm going to pick on you just a minute. He's got a Bible that he's been carrying in his back pocket. He's wore it out. This will be the third time I've given that young man a Bible. Now, for most of you, I would say I'd be tired of giving you a Bible, but he literally reads it and wears it out. And if you wear your Bible out, bring it to me, and I'll give you another one. That's the greatest thing that a Christian could say, is that I wore my Bible out reading it. Amen. Go ahead and pull that last slide up. Roberto, if you're ready, come on up. He's coming to play, and as we do, we'll, we're going to close here in just a few minutes. The last category of this is the, those that are praying for the harvest. The last character of this is who Jesus asked to pray. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest field. You see, those that are tired and weary, you feel like you've been doing it. You feel like you're, you're uh, tired of doing the same things and you're tired of, of taking your time. Some of us, we've done it for so long, we want to take a break. We want to, you know, it's like this. I can tell you this. When you, are, when you are in the will of God and you are in the work of God, there is no retirement. You can retire from your job, and if that's what your job is, retire from it. That's good. It's great. If you've earned that, you can retire. Thank goodness. I'm afraid to retire. Really, I am, because my wife will put me employment at the Pratt household, so I am glad to. (laughs) But you will never be able to retire from the call of God in your life. Because I don't care how old you are, I don't care where you are, God will use you for His glory. He will use you to share the message of Jesus Christ. As long as there's breath in your lungs, there's a purpose. He has a reason. 
And until he calls you home, he has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for you. Those that he spoke to and those that he said to pray were the disciples. Those that were sitting there close to him that he was sharing. And he said the laborers are, the harvest is truly great. He talked about the size of the harvest. He talked about the magnitude and the, and the need of the harvest being brought in. But he said pray to the Lord of the harvest. Because he knew 12 wasn't going to handle it. He knew 12 wasn't going to handle it. You know, they say that the average pastor can reach about 75 people successfully. Now, I might be stretching it, Joe, because actually the, the average size of the church in the United States with one pastor was just about 55, 50, right around there. And, and here's the problem, is that a lot of the congregations will say, go get them, pastor. You get them, you do it. You got it. Boy, pastor's a real whooper whopper. He's a go-getter. But God didn't say pray for one. He prayed for many. Pray for the laborers. Multiply the effect of the 12 to reach the lost. I pray every Tuesday night we come together and when we pray, I pray God send forth those who are willing to do. Send, send, us, send me, make, help me to reach, help me to do. Help, God, because there's so much to do, I can't do it all. And I pray, God, help me to prepare the hearts and the minds of the people so that they can see the opportunities and seize it. Because sometimes when you've been at it for a while, you get tired. Anybody ever been tired? You get tired. And you've been teaching, you've been preaching, you've been, you've been cleaning, you've been doing, and it gets, it gets tired. Amen. Sometimes you just need somebody to come along and say, hey, I see that this is yours, but can I help? Can I help? Yeah, you can help. A lot of times it's just doing the little things. That makes a difference. Jesus, when he told his disciples to pray for the pray for the laborers of the harvest, he began to tell them because he wanted them to be burdened for the souls that were surrounding them. He wanted to begin to believing for salvation. He, he wanted to, to see hell emptied and heaven filled. That's what Jesus was saying. Pray for the laborers of the harvest field. Because I know these 12 can't do it. I know these 12 can't do it by themselves. So he said, first of all, and here's what I want us to do. We're going to finish this morning because I believe that we're all called to be laborers in the harvest field. I believe that God has called us all. We have, a, we have a ministry. I told you last week, we're all set forth to preach the gospel. You don't have to have a degree. Listen, if God can use a donkey, he can use you. Turn to somebody and say Amen. If God can use anyone, he can use you. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to... Listen, sometimes we shy away because of one reason or another reason. I'm not smart enough. I, I used the excuse for so long that, well, I, I didn't read well. I hid behind that. I hid behind my excuses for so long and God took them away one by one by one. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is no reason for us not to be useful for God. And we need to pray. We need to pray for one another. Amen? Husbands, pray for your wives. Wives, pray for your husbands. Come on. Parents, pray for your kids. Pray for your aunts, your uncles, your cousins. Pray for your families. Start calling them out, calling them out, praying for them, praying for God to deal with them. Begin to pray for your neighbors. How many of you know your neighbor's name? If you don't know them, you need to knock on their door. What is your name? Yeah, you know what I did one time? I didn't know my neighbors, and my pastor was telling this message, and he said, you need to know your neighbor. Who is your neighbor is what he titled the message. 
And he said, if you don't know your neighbor, you need to find out. And I prayed and I prayed. And me and this, the guy that lived beside me, he was always gone when I'd come in. And I said, I need to find out his name. And I was praying. I said, God, somehow let me meet my neighbor. Amen. And you know what happened? I got a letter in the mail that was addressed to the wrong address. You've been there. Yeah. And, and so I, I said, well, I'll take this mail over because it looked important. It looked like a check. And I knocked on his door and, and nobody answered. And so I put a note. I said, I got some mail for you. When you get home, please come see me. He come over to my door and I said, I got some mail for you. He started to run and I said, so your name is? I read his name off the envelope and I said, it's nice to meet you. I'm Greg Pratt. And he was thinking, oh, this guy is weird. And I said, I just wanted to let you know, listen, if you get any of my mail or I get any of your mail, I, I want to make sure that you get your mail and, and I get my mail. And, and, and I, I said, you know, I, I notice you're gone a lot and you're busy. I know you've got a couple kids. Is it okay if we pick up your kids on Sunday morning and take them to church with us? He looked at me, he goes, yeah, because I always have to find a babysitter anyways. He said, that'd be great. We ended up picking those kids up for the whole time we lived in that house. And the whole time that we lived right there, we brought them to church and we led them to the Lord. They accepted the Lord through the children's church ministry. I'm going to tell you something. When you meet your neighbor, you can plant a seed that can bring a harvest. You need to know your neighbors. You're moving into a new place. First thing you need to do is go around. Hi, I'm just moving into the neighborhood. I'd like to meet you. I'm... You need to know your neighbors. And we move so quickly and we're so busy in our life. And most of us don't ever take time to realize the harvest is all around us. We just got to be busy. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray. Uh, go ahead and pull that next one up. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray uh, for the lost. And we need to pray for the ones that need salvation. We need to pray and call them out. We need to pray and say, God, convict their hearts and their minds. Sometimes when you pray that way, and this is hard to say, but sometimes when you pray that way, God will shake the foundations of their life and they'll look for hope and you'll be that answer. When you pray for the lost, God will shake the foundations and he will use you in that moment to touch their lives. Thirdly, I believe that we need to pray for opportunities to share. Pray for God to give us opportunity to share. God, help me take time to share the message of Jesus Christ with everyone I meet. You may take it for granted that they're saved, but don't. I'll challenge you parents and grandparents. Listen to me. Ask your kids. If you were to die today, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know him? If you don't, maybe you, you need to know him and know that God loves you. The most important thing you'll ever do in your life for your children, your grandchildren, is to make sure they're ready to meet the Lord.